This is how Colonel Ibrahim Babangida aborted the Dimka coup few hours after the assassination of the head of state in 1976. Hello, 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 His Plus. Welcome back to another episode on His Pool Media. Get well here. Remember to smash the like button on this video and subscribe to the channel. Subscription is free. Just click the red button down below. Thank you. Lagos on February 13, 1976 was like every other day in post-Civil War Nigeria. Nigeria's state military head of state, General Moritala Ramat Mohamed, was heading to work on that fateful money without fanfare or the usual motor card that came to be associated with our leaders before him. The head of state was said to be very casual about matters of his own personal safety. On that fateful day, February 13, 1976, the only visible weapon of protection for the head of state was a pistol strapped to the side of his ADC, Hakim Shenwa. While on queue behind other vehicles in the infamous Lagos traffic, his vehicle was ambushed and riddled with bullets in a coup attempt led by Lieutenant Colonel B.S. Dimka. Mohammed was killed along with his ADC and driver. After killing the head of state, Dimka proceeded to make the following broadcast at the NBC studios. He said, Good morning fellow Nigerians. This is Lieutenant Colonel B. Dimka of the Nigerian Army calling. I bring you good tidings. Moritala Mohammed's deficiency has been detected. His government is now overthrown by the young revolutionaries. Any attempt to foil these plans from many quarters will be met with death. Everyone should be calm. Please stay by your radio for further announcements. All borders, air and sea ports are closed until further notice. Coffee is imposed from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you. We are all together. Unfortunately, Dimka and his so-called young revolutionaries could not take power. While at the premises of the NBC making the broadcast, a group of officers including Ibrahim Babangida and Mohammed Sani, aka Sami, were dispatched to storm the place and get him arrested. Instead of storming the place as the order was given, Ibrahim Babangida decided to approach Dimka, who incidentally was his friend, calmly, boldly and courageously. This would later turn out to be the best thing he has ever done. More bloodshed was averted. Some people believe that Ibrahim Babangida came into prominence for his role in aborting this coup. Although Babangida said he instructed Ojokojo to use a megaphone at the NBC, Sani claimed it was he who used a megaphone to tell Dimka to surrender or they were going to deal with him. According to him, he and Ibrahim Babangida talked to Dimka over the fence. Dimka had threatened that if they were not careful with him, he would demolish Dodon barracks. So after this threat, they went quickly to mobilize armored cars through Danjuma. Even though Sami is reluctant to allow anyone take credit for aborting the coup, he however gave credit to Ibrahim Babangida. He admits that Babangida tried to persuade Dimka to surrender. He gave credit to Ibrahim Babangida for an act of courage because according to him, to go calmly and boldly to confront an enemy when you didn't know the strength at his disposal was a brave act. From what has been established, Babangida remained in Sami's office while his men were clearing the NBC of Dimka and his men. Evident that his men had the upper hand soon came with the arrest of Major KK Gagara, Rabu and others. They were brought to Sami's office and ordered to be locked up in the guard's room. Shagaya and Ojokoju reported back to Babangida that Dimka had escaped. There were some conflicting reports about this initially. His ADC, Lieutenant Garba, was shot and left to bleed to death at the NBC premises, but nothing was heard of Dimka. Initial reports said he had committed suicide by jumping into a pond behind the corporation. This letter proved to be incorrect because attempts to fish him out did not produce any result. After speaking with Ibrahim Babangida, Dimka knew his game was up. If Babangida returned, it would be a bloody battle. Dimka did not wait for Babangida's return either. He calmly walked out of the station. His own account as his trial indicates that he went back to his house before melting into thin air for several weeks. He was arrested at a checkpoint in Afikbu near Abakelike in present-day Ibonyi state while trying to escape to Cameroon to cross the state border. Babangita became the star in that brief bloody drama. As far as the Nigerian public was concerned, 
everyone else played a supporting role to Babangida in it. He was the hero. An emergency meeting of the Supreme Military Council was convened that afternoon, at which the Chief of Staff, Supreme Headquarters Lieutenant General Olujugino Basinjo, was confirmed Head of State in succession to Mohammed. At the venue of the meeting, Major General Emmanuel Abisoye, who would later chair the Military Board of Inquiry, commended Babangida for his role in aborting the coup. Abisoye said, Look, I was told you saved the day. How did you do it? Babangida replied, No, sir. I didn't save the day. God saved the day. Babangida remains modest about his role, insisting he did no more than his professional duty as a soldier to the nation. This became a stepping stone to greater things for the then Colonel Ibrahim Babangida. His confrontation with Timka, unarmed, remains a stuff of hero worship in the armed forces and the public. It casts the Colonel in the role of the brave good guy against the bad guys who killed Moritala Mohammed. A myth was bound to grow around him, and it certainly did. There was an outpouring of praises from his fellow officers across board. A sample of such opinions include that from Major General Mohammed Maguru, who said, It was a display of courage. You can relate what he did at the NBC to what he did at the war front, when he single-handedly evacuated Duba, who was shot, under heavy enemy fire. But this was even a bigger risk because it was not a battlefield. This was a military coup. But for him to have summoned the courage not to remain inside the armored car, but to have gone out physically to speak to Dimka, yes, it was a display of courage and self-confidence. Then, according to Major General Sunday Ifere, he had done it before. Remember the capture of Umuahia. He was using his coolness and bravery to convince Dimka. Dimka too had confidence in him, and he was willing to listen to him. Babangida did not have any other magic. If they had sent any other man to go and talk to Dimka under that tense situation, Dimka would have blown up the person. It was because he was calm and brave and popular that he was able to accomplish the feat. Major General Gadonasco said, It was a brave action. He is brave and fearless. It takes a lot of courage for one to go and face people who are armed, more so for someone who was listed among those to be killed. Remember, Babangida was one of those listed to be killed in that coup. Major General Abdusalami Abubakar, who later succeeded General Sani Abacha as head of state in 1998, said, It needs courage to go and face somebody with a gun when you are unarmed. Agreed, as a soldier you are taught to fight, but it needs some extra courage. Normally, an officer would try and go with his troops to disarm somebody who turned rebellious, but to go unarmed need more than ordinary training. For several days after the incident, Babangida felt uncomfortable with himself. How did the whole thing escape him? He was the government's listening ear. More embarrassing for him was the fact that most of those who took part in the coup were his boys. Babangida then admits that he took advantage of his relationship with Dimka. He said Dimka was his friend. I had a relationship with virtually everyone that was involved in the Dimka coup. All of them were my boys at one stage or the other. I saved them from either financial or marital problems. These were boys who could walk into my house anytime and eat whatever they found. I used to enjoy discussing military affairs with them. They were very interesting to be with, but they were very vocal and very, very militant. Major Clement Dabang was one of those very young talks in the army. One of those implicated in the coup to Babangida's greatest shock was his friend, Colonel Weir. He and Babangida were together less than 24 hours before the coup. So, how come the latter never had an inkling of what was afoot? This is one of the questions that puzzles everybody, including Babangida himself. One possible explanation is that there are still doubts about Weir's involvement. He was most probably implicated on purely circumstantial evidence. Here is one account of how Weir found himself among the coup plotters. He visited Dimka in his house the night before the coup and found him drunk at what looked like a party going on in his house. He then left Dimka. On the basis of this visit, he was arrested along with Dabang and the others. He too was tried and convicted by the military tribunal. 
when his sentence came before the Supreme Military Council for confirmation. However, the council was split 50-50 for and against his conviction. The head of state, General Obasanjo, allegedly cast a deciding vote that sealed Weir's fate. Watch this video here for detailed history of Moritala Mohammed and his assassination, or here for trial and execution of Dimka and others. Remember to smash the like button on this video, subscribe and enable notification so you will not miss our future uploads. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.